Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Nitin Dahad, Editor-in-Chief of Embedded.com and also a correspondent with EE Times. Um, our agenda for today's event is to look at the future for trusted computers. So I'll, I'll start off and then we'll be um, Professor Adam Joinson will talk about the social economic, social economic impact of security on, the, on trust. Uh, Philip Wilson will look at a case study on, of security in e-commerce. Tim Silversides will uh, then look at growing business and differentiating through security by design. And then Professor Maya, Maya O'Neill on the future of trusted computers. But before we go to our speakers, let's look at the story so far from earlier events in the series. We're here today at Bletchley Park, uh, the National Museum of Computing. What we're doing is looking at the history of computing. Then we can uh, better understand how to create more trusted computers in the future. The contrast between this piece of kit and the Turing machine, it could not be more extreme. I mean, I don't think that he had any idea in his mind that the future might be formed of a sort of fusion between these two concepts. We had one big trouble with trying to do digital security by design in 1975. We didn't have enough transistors. We've heard from a lot of really interesting speakers. Uh, I've certainly learned a lot. And I had no idea about how computing started and the different kinds of innovations that have happened over the last 50 years or so. The Digital Security by Design Technology Access Program is your opportunity to get involved and experiment with this technology. The initiative hopes that the technology is developed will underpin future digital products and services. The full potential of, of the SBD, including issues such as use cases, uh, socio-technical impacts, um, to say nothing of the regulatory frameworks that are likely to accompany its adoption, these are all situated in volatile, uncertain and unknown future. The UK can be a leader in this place. Our national cyber strategy 2022 is to make the UK into a leading global cyber power. It's been a really interesting day today and I can't wait for the next event at Glasgow. Today we're at Glasgow Science Centre looking at where we are with cyber security. We specifically had talks looking at uh, the context and then actually what are the technologies that are being developed Software, we buy it, it's broken all the time. We just don't know it's broken until people discover that. And often it's the wrong kind of people who discover that, that it's actually broken. What got us to this stage without being hit by a cyber attack is probably luck. We expect bridges to stay up and buildings to stay up. So you expect engineers to solve those problems for you. And really we're doing something very similar for computers. We need to stop patching things up with the uh, cyber equivalent of gaffer tape. Um, and actually fix the foundations. We're trying to build new hardware and software technologies that fundamentally mitigate security vulnerabilities. Cybersecurity is not just a technical issue. What we really need to do is educate the non-technical people around cybersecurity in the organizations. We need to start at the top. We've got to learn to get the right balance between people, uh, the software and the hardware. Maybe we're living with 20th century technology and the 21st century expectations. The need for a holistic view of cybersecurity is paramount, and I think that was very strongly emphasised in the talks today. And I really look forward to having more events like this to get the message out there better. In Wales, we have a really strong cyber network. We've got a number of clusters that get together to discuss cyber-related issues. Bringing the roadshow here to Wales is really important. Today is about the uh, third step in our journey on the history of computing from the beginnings through to where security ends up. The reality is our programs are getting more complicated. The applications are getting bigger. What people end up wanting to do is they want to be able to compartmentalize the software. We really hope that um, with the DSP new technologies, um, we can develop our uh, connected vehicle applications on top of that, making vehicles more secure. This is a global shift that's occurring. We're actually trying to change the way computers run software. Let's fix those foundations. 
So if we can't rewrite all of the existing code, can we at the very least stop adding to the amount of unsafe code in the world? Cherry C gives us very strong confidentiality and integrity guarantees. Cherry was designed as much for sharing as it was for isolation. There's a lot of initiatives and programs that are going on around digital security by design, but the time is now for different parts of the ecosystem to collaborate and really work together. And something that's close to my heart is diversity, it's experience, it's skills, it's cultural background. And when you collaborate with other people, you embrace that diversity and get the best outcomes. So this is very much an open invitation um, for companies to get familiar with this technology and help us understand um, what are some of the benefits and potential improvements for the future. The moments from the, the three roadshow events so far. Um, our wonderful scribe, who you'll see over on the, uh, the board there, Chris, um, has documented the event with his visualizations, and you'll be seeing him do the same to, for today's event. As you can see, you know, previous events looked at the history of computing um, and how the quest for more and more performance meant the computer architectures that evolved to meet this need over the last 50 years or so have carried some inherent security vulnerabilities. We were introduced to some approaches for fixing the foundations for security and about Cherry, which is a new hardware technology that mitigates some of the software security vulnerabilities. We also looked at um, how to strengthen the foundations to make the world more secure, including why partnerships and collaborations are important in the adoption of new technologies. Um, as you saw, yeah, some of the things, yeah, it's not, we've got here by luck and not by design. So I think that's the point of some of these roadshows. And this was uh, earlier this week, you can uh, see, uh, we have some, some Welsh there as well. But um, yeah, we were looking at, are we heading for a cyber disaster? John asked that question. And uh, this is now where we get the opportunity to look at what is a future for trusted computers. So with that context, I'm going to turn to our first speaker. Uh, Professor Adam Joynson is director of Describe Hub, Describe Plus, sorry, Describe Hub Plus, get that right. <laughs> University of Bath, where he conducts interdisciplinary research on the interaction between human behavior and technology, with specific foci on issues of how the design of systems influences behavior, ranging from privacy and self-disclosure, cybersecurity, social relations, and patterns of influence. He's also the program lead for risk and online behavior for the National Center for Research and Evidence on Security Threats as well as currently running funded projects on individually suscept individual susceptibility to malevolent influence techniques, such as scams and phishing. Um, he also has an interest in big data generally and the use of computational social science to gain insights into social and workplace behaviors. Hi, good morning, everyone. Uh, this is my first stand up and talk for two years, so this might all go horribly wrong. We'll, we'll see how it goes. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll just have to imagine you're all on a little screen and, um, and it'll be fine. Uh, so thank you for the introduction. My name's uh, Adam Joyce and I'm director of the uh, um, Describe Hub Plus. I'm a behavioral scientist. And as you can imagine, there's not that many behavioral scientists working in the field of um, hardware um, and hardware architecture. So. Um, no, we'll see how it goes. Um, I'll give a really brief overview of the Describe Hub Plus. So our full name is the ESRC Digital Security by Design Social Science Hub Plus. So you can see why we kind of shortened it. Um, and we have two core missions. One is about bringing people together across boundaries, technologists, regulators, policymakers, end users, social scientists, arts and humanities really to unite behind a shared vision about what digital security by design is and what it could potentially enable in the future. We also have our own research agenda, which is about understanding the societal and economic implications of both insecurity and of digital security by design. And all of our program focuses on these two core missions that we have. And so, for example, we... Um, 
we have our own research focus around four different elements based at the four universities and our uh, commissioned research that we also put out. So at the University of Bath, we focus on adoption and we're interested in investment models. So how do you decide how much to invest in cybersecurity and where to invest in cybersecurity? And we're also interested in what the barriers are in terms of that investment. At the University of Bristol, they're focused on readiness and particularly around software developers and the readiness um, of software developers to program for DSBD. At Royal Holloway University of London, their focus is on regulation and the regulatory environment that encourages, enables and the levers within it to the adoption of digital security by design. And at the University of Cardiff, their focus is on sectoral differences and societal cultural differences in terms of the adoption of secure technologies. Uh, we also have a fund of around a million pound that we commission research out into the wider academic community. So we've completed some scoping reviews which are at the top and we're just about to announce our next round of um, successful projects where we have five different projects that we're commissioning and these include computer scientists, arts and humanities, uh, business studies and um, economists and I think we've got a psychologist hidden in there as well looking at everything from um, readiness to um, adopt and building a tool to understand awareness of organizations around digital security by design to open data and the implications of Cherry DSBD for um, open data initiatives within banking through to SMEs and also digital sovereignty and the impact of moves within the European Union and elsewhere around digital sovereignty and what the implications of that will be for the microprocessor industry. So we have a whole range of new projects coming online. And you also heard in one of the videos, uh, one of our members, Genevieve Lively from the University of Bristol, talking about the future of digital security by design and art. And a lot of our work in the last year has been around trying to envision what future digital security by design might offer to us and what stories we can tell and what the risks and opportunities are there. And so we've been doing lots of work around the metaphors for digital security by design and for comp compartmentalization and how we go about communicating some of the challenges and some of the benefits from the hardware layer up to kind of the policy level. So that covers the Describe Hub. So I'm just going to start by talking about the economic impact of security and insecurity. And so we know that lots of people are concerned about insecurity and about breaches and privacy breaches. So here we have some data on the um, left-hand side from the Pew Internet and American Life project showing that 81% of people are concerned about the data that's collected by companies and so on and so forth. And on the right-hand side, we have from the Oxford Internet Institute their latest data on people's concerns around privacy and use of the internet. And we can see that concerns about privacy and concerns about security are growing at the consumer level. Oh, wrong way. We also know that the cost of breaches is increasing. So the latest um, UK government cyber breaches survey, 2021, they're just collecting 22's um, data at the moment, shows that the cost of breaches is increasing for UK companies. The average cost is around £8,000, but that's the average cost, obviously, for some it's a lot larger, for some um, it's smaller, but we know for certain that the cost of breaches is increasing and that around 75% of organisations have had some form of cybersecurity incident in the previous year. And if we look about the cost of security from an organisational level, on the left hand side is the percentage of IT budget across different countries that's spent purely on security, not on business function. And the UK is hidden somewhere in there, and it's around 11% of IT budgets across organisations are spent on security. And this is completely unseeable, but, um, so you'll just have to trust me on this. But um, the typical cost of remediating a ransomware attack 
in the UK is just under $2 million. So that's the average cost of um, kind of whether it's paying a ransom or whether it's rebuilding systems or anything else, the average cost is $2 million US dollars in the UK. So clearly insecurity has a major kind of economic cost for businesses. We can also look at what happens if you have an information security breach or challenge or issue as an organization on your stock price. And as part of our work within um, the Hub Plus, we've been reviewing all of the studies, and we found over 70, that's, that have looked at the impact of security breaches on the share price of organizations. And not surprisingly, we find a negative impact of um, a breach on the share price. And there was a, a report published in 2021 in Computers and Security, slightly smaller numbers, I think it was 48 studies, which found exactly the same. But if you experience an information security breach of some form or other, your share price is, um, is reduced, negatively impacted. And this is particularly the case in the financial industry, where perhaps we see it as particularly important. Quite depressingly, we've also been looking at the impact of announcing a big investment in your security on your share price. And we only found four studies that had looked at the impact of this, and only one found it was a positive impact. 75% of the time, although albeit only three out of four studies, announcing that you were making a big investment in security had no impact on your share price. People did not reward you for um, for investing in security in terms of um, your stock. In the workplace, security is also problematic. For many employees, security is not their primary concern. We're all interested in security. So we think about it all the time, and it is our primary concern. For most people, it's not. In fact, for most people, security is something that stops them achieving their goals. And so, for example, I've done a work with a large UK um, company where the architects couldn't send their um, plans out to clients because the files were too large for the email system. They weren't allowed to um, use USB drives. They weren't allowed to burn onto um, CD, DVD, and they couldn't use cloud services. And so what they had to do was just log on to their Gmail and email it to themselves, or sometimes leave it in their draft email box, and then pick it up and send it from home. Now, you know, that's because if they didn't do that, they wouldn't be achieving their basic work goal. And what we see is huge levels of frustration amongst workers in terms of the policies and processes that security puts on us. And that's why large numbers of people don't upgrade and don't accept um, updates on their computers because we, we know that actually most of the time updates make your computing experience worse. And so we don't actually kind of see security as something that enables and supports our work. Instead, we see it as something that um, makes it worse. During COVID, what we have also seen is an increase in surveillance and the use of surveillance and control as a security mechanism. And We've known for years that increasing surveillance in the workplace, increasing control in the workplace, leads to lower morale, lower levels of trust in the workplace, and increased churn and turnover. And so for many employees, security is a dirty word. Security is something that actually makes our jobs worse. And so how do we deal with this? Well, one way we can think about it is we can start to think about security as a public good. So public goods are things that are um, called non-rivalrous and non-exclusive. What that means is that if I use it, that doesn't re reduce the likelihood that you will also benefit from it, but it also means that once it's available, I can't stop anyone else actually benefiting from it too. So like lighthouses, once I've built a lighthouse, it doesn't matter whether you contribute to building that lighthouse or not, you still benefit from it. But if I benefit from that lighthouse, then it doesn't stop someone else benefiting from it at the same time. And security, we're arguing, is actually a public good in this respect. We already think about things like clean air, national security, as public goods that we all benefit from. And cybersecurity, we can start to think of as a public good, but that actually has new challenges around how we go about supporting and the level of intervention and the level of government regulation that we involve. Because the problem with public goods is a free rider problem, which is how do we actually fund 
and support something that we can't charge people to benefit from. And so on to trust. Trust is typically seen as associated with vulnerability. So we only need to trust when we meet, make ourselves vulnerable to the outcomes of other people. Trust is only necessary when we can't control those outcomes. And so if we increase monitoring, if we increase surveillance through control, and so on, we actually reduce the need for trust within a system. And we know trust matters. Here's a study from um, last year on um, compliance with COVID um, public health regulations across the globe and the relationship between compliance and trust in scientists, trust in government, and so on. And what we see is a general pattern where trust determines a level of compliance with public health regulations. Trust is needed in general business exchanges, both in the quality of the goods and the services, in the expectation of finding someone to exchange with in terms of the actual marketplace and the rules within the marketplace. It allows us to focus on specialized activities, like coming here and doing work on cybersecurity, rather than you know, having to do everything, having to feed ourselves and grow our food, having to educate our children and so on. Instead, we trust other people to do that, and it allows us as a society to develop and grow and innovate purely because we trust other people. It also allows for wider levels of innovation. So Francis um, Fukuyama talks about how in low trust societies, we tend to build organizations around kinship ties and family. And that limits the growth, both in terms of the number of people and also the skills that you can draw on. And so actually, high levels of trust mean that we can innovate and we can build and we can grow faster. It also allows for risk taking. And we know there's a problem with trust. Trust in all political parties across the UK has been falling since 2016 and continues to fall. Trust across all institutions in the UK, media, government, NGOs, is lower now than it used to be. According to the Edelman Trust Barometer, no single um, sector in society is judged to be both competent and ethical, which are the two key components of trust. We have a real trust problem in terms of the levels of trust within society. This is particularly the case with technology. This is, again, it's from the Edelman, the latest trust barometer report that they put out where they survey across the globe. Large numbers of people are worried about technology, the pace of technological change. We see changes across the globe in terms of falling levels of trust. And trust in particular innovations lags trust in the actual sector. So if you look at the technology sector, 76 people say generally they trust technology. Only 63% of people say that they actually have trust in AI and robotics. And we see this all the way across particular innovations. Levels of trust in the innovations is lower. And one of the challenges is how can security address this trust problem that we have, because we see trust actually can be reduced by levels of surveillance and levels of control. Now, one way is through competence, right? So one element of trust is um, that we, tr we trust because we expect someone to be competent. Doesn't necessarily generalize. I may trust um, Amazon to deliver books, but I may not trust them to give me health advice. You know? And part of that trust is not necessarily about ethics, it's about levels of perceived competence to actually conduct a transaction. And so we can increase trust by keeping stuff safe and secure and working, which of course is one of the core elements of security. Another element of trust is about strong boundaries. Interpersonally, trust is about not giving out information, but actually it's about a belief and understanding that that information will stay within the boundaries that you've um, set. And so if you tell someone a secret, that helps build a relationship, helps build trust, but it also stays. And so one of the challenges is that trust cannot flourish in a perfectly secure world, which might sound odd, but in a perfectly secure world where everything is assured, everything is controlled, everything is kind of um, tracked, 
We cannot have the vulnerability that's needed to demonstrate that we can be trusted because trust is about vulnerability. And so how do we get the benefits of trust that we have in the offline world, in the digital world? And I would say that increasing surveillance and control is not the way to do it. And I think most people have accepted that. However, a security that focuses on the maintenance of boundaries, which is how we build trust in offline settings, does have that potential. And we heard about confidentiality and we heard about integrity in the videos as being core elements of um, DSBD. And my argument would be that the way in which we can actually start building trust and a trusted digital future is through technology that supports these boundaries and this confidentiality and integrity within these boundaries rather than increased levels of monitoring and increased levels of surveillance and control. And that's what will allow us to build a trusted future. Thank you. I think I'm moving on, aren't I? Oh. Thank you. Um, that's actually very good in setting, setting context. So next we're going to hear from uh, Philip Wilson, and I'll quickly do a quick intro. Um, Philip Wilson began his career on Wall Street, building trading and financial analytic systems in C++. He left that world after several years to join Amazon.com, working in areas including order processing and, after moving to England, product catalog production. Since then, he led engineering organizations for Gumtree and Last.fm. Most of us should remember Last.fm. Uh, before returning to e-commerce at The Hut Group, a vertically integrated digital first consumer brands group, retailing its own brands predominantly in beauty and in nutrition, plus third party brands via its proprietary end-to-end e-commerce technology infrastructure and brand building platform. Philip, come to the stage. So I'm Phil Wilson. Uh, my title is Director of Research and Development. Uh, fundamentally, I'm a computer programmer. Uh, who else is a computer programmer? Just Okay, good, a few of us. Who, who ever wrote a program in C? Okay, good. Um, THG is not a household name, probably. Uh, I'm hoping some of our brands will be household names for you. If you go to the gym a lot, you may see my protein stuff. Uh, if you buy cosmetics or hair care or skin care products or are... Uh, Attached to someone who does, uh, you may know look fantastic. Um, we evolved as an e-commerce company, oh, started 17 years ago or so, uh, building a platform on which to sell, in those days, uh, CDs and DVDs and entertainment products that mostly don't exist anymore, have pivoted several times. The interesting thing is that we've built a platform on which it's fairly easy to express new branded websites in a very full stack sort of way. So that's contrast to the Amazon style business model where you have one big superstore. We have lots of little stores. Hopefully they're focused, they're curated. They appeal to specific demographics. Um, we have laterally expanded that to do work with other typically fairly big brands, often marketing led companies for whom technology is not core competence. Uh, so we're running websites now for home base and some of these folks. Um, in technology, we've got on the order of 700 software developers. It's hard to get a proper count, but there are a lot of us. We write all of our own stuff. That's pretty weird in e-commerce, right? Mostly e-commerce companies do okay by buying things off the peg from IBM or SAP, or that sort of thing, but we write our own. Um, and we can provide lots of services for you if you're interested. And being a big online pro uh, property, we, uh, we have a lot of cybercrime concerns. And I suspect they're the same as all of yours. This is actually a little bit boring, isn't it? Um, there's ransomware, there's phishing. The one that really keeps me up at night is people breaking in and stealing data. GDPR cost me 5% of, of global revenue. That's a big deal for us. We did 2.2 billion last year, so that's a big number. Um, data breaches, spyware, viruses, all these things degrade the quality of life. The risks, thank you, Adam, but these things are hard to quantify right now. It's kind of a big insurance 
program against bad things that might happen. And on the whole, we don't have any secret sauce here. We do probably the same thing you do, which is we scurry around and patch things every week, maybe every day. We train our employees. We, uh, uh, we buy commercial products that mitigate against denial of service attacks and network things. We watch things very closely. But generally, it's a training plus reactive kind of situation. And I suspect it's that way in your world as well. Um, so, so I want to take a digression here and talk about something that happened very early in my career and it made an impression on me. And, uh, uh, and I don't know if you'll have heard this story recently, perhaps. Um, but it happened in 1988. I was, uh, I was writing software for a financial analytics company in C running on MS-DOS PCs. Uh, and the internet itself was, was quite small, mostly academia, a little bit of government stuff going on. 60,000 hosts, um, mostly 56K lines, some T1s. Anybody remember those? Uh, they were really fast. No websites. Tim Berners-Lee had not done his magic. There was no hypertext transfer protocol. DNS was not widespread. That turns out to be important for this discussion. Um, so how did machines know about each other? Well, they had files. You probably still have files like this called hosts files. Uh, and, um, and if you want to know what machines a machine knows about, you look in its hosts file, and that gives a name to address mapping, right? It's uh, sort of the social graph for computers. Um, and a Cornell grad student called Robert Morris wrote a program. Uh, it's a little bit famous. Um, Morris apparently was he's very bright. His dad uh, was a security researcher at Bell Labs, where Unix comes from. And, uh, and he went to Harvard and then Cornell. Apparently, he had a, uh, he was a bit of a prankster. I don't know this firsthand. Um, but he decided to write a program to visit all of the machines on the internet. Now remember, that wasn't very many. There were a few thousand, right? Um, so it was a recursive traversal. This is a little bit like wandering the social graph or the six degrees of separation problem, right? So, so it's a graph traversal problem. Um, and he would go to a host and then see which hosts it know about, and then go to those hosts see which hosts they know about, and so forth. And, uh, and social graphs are cyclic, right? So some machines, you get these three-way things where I know about you, and you know about him, and he knows about me. And so you have to be careful when you program this sort of thing not to, uh, not to get in cycles. Uh, and he was. He did that. Um, but the way, he, the way he decided not to get in a cycle was he wanted to see whether his process was already running. So that's easy enough to interrogate. Um, but he was worried that system administrators would catch on to him and run fake processes with his process name. So he decided 14% of the time to cheat. And, uh, and when he cheated, he would revisit a machine even though his, his process apparently was already running there. So is anyone doing the math? Do you know what happened? Um, this made the New York Times. I'm from New York. I don't know if that's clear. Um, I read this in real time. It was quite amazing. Uh, he invented the first distributed denial of service attack accidentally with a botnet, accidentally. And his bots ran on government and university machines, and he took out the Department of Defense. And boy, was that exciting. And in fact, uh, he was the first person prosecuted under some Computer Security Crimes Act, uh, which I've lost the name of just now. Uh, and he wound up ultimately being convicted and uh, did a little bit of community service. Um, and I should say, actually, so Robert Morris is now a fairly luminary professor at MIT. He, uh, he famously, with Paul Graham, founded a, a shopping company called Vionet, which he sold to Yahoo for $60 million in the 19... Around 2000, I guess. Uh, that made them both uh, wealthy enough that they founded a thing called Y Combinator, uh, which has been rather successful for them. So you've probably heard about that. So we don't weep any tears for Robert Morris. He taught us some interesting stories. Um, but, but there's a part of this story that I skipped. And that is, 
How did he get logins on all those machines, right? Uh, and the answer is important for us here. Um, basically, he wrote a rootkit. Uh, that's what we call it today. It, um, it had a password guesser. There was the equivalent of SSH in those days, so you could set up remote keys. Uh, we called it RSH then. It wasn't secure. Uh, so if you could guess a login, then you could log into the computers that that guy knew about. Uh, the password guessers in 1988 were simpler than they are now. Um, I'm told it involved potty mouth. Uh, so he followed that trajectory. Then there was a specific debug uh, mechanism for invoking send mail, which is how computers in those days sent mail to each other, which he took uh, advantage of. But the more interesting one for today's purposes is an exploit in a demon called Finger D. Does anyone remember Finger? So before there was a World Wide Web, um, the young people I tell this to think it's kind of funny, but, but uh, it used to be you didn't have a home page, right? You didn't have a LinkedIn. You didn't have any of that stuff. But people could find you and learn about you by fingering you. You type finger fill at host. Uh, and initially, this, this took place on many computers that were just shared in departments. So there was no networking involved. But it was a logical thing to extend it to the internet when that happened. So you can finger user at host name, connects on port 79. The daemon is a fairly simple thing. Uh, what it does is it gets attached to the, uh, to the network connection, and it reads standard input. So C programmers will know what that means. Uh, it reads standard input, and it's reading for a query string. And it does what all C programs do, which is it takes the string that it reads and it sticks it in a buffer. And it had a 512 byte allocated buffer on the stack, so a local variable. Um, and that's a big string. That was big enough, right? Nobody should have any trouble with that. And it probably never crashed in normal operation. But Morris figured out that if you, if you fed it a query string, a specially crafted query string that was longer than 512 bytes, the stack grows down in address space, right? So if you go past the end of a buffer, you're writing up into the stack, and pretty soon you can clobber the return address of the function. And in those days, it was actually fairly straightforward to put in a little piece of code right there in that text that you could then jump to. And that's what Morris did. Uh, and it let him run a remote shell. So nowadays, we call this remote code execution and, or, and uh, taking over the machine. Uh, and he did that, and he recursively did his thing. Um, and when I first learned about this 34 years ago, it blew my mind. As a C programmer, you've probably had bugs that are sort of like this. You do it by mistake, and it crashes. But to be able to take advantage of that was really quite a remarkable thing. Um, but the most remarkable thing is that this is still with us. This is absolutely still with us every day. Um, and it's due to some fairly fundamental architectural things. Uh, I believe you've all had talks about Cherry before, so I, I should be careful about this. Um, but fundamentally, the problem is that we address memory in computers with integers. And we're allowed to do maths on those integers. And uh, memory is used for storing objects. The computer doesn't actually know about objects. The computer knows about bytes. So it's up to the system software and your programming language and you, the programmer, to know how to make objects out of memory. And that means you can cheat. And you can, make, uh, you can use memory for things it wasn't intended for. Uh, also, in, in von Neumann architecture machines, which all of our machines are these days, uh, instructions and data get stored in the same place, more or less. It's a little bit more complicated now than in Morris's day, but fundamentally, that's still the story. Uh, so it's easy in poorly crafted C code to take advantage of someone's <coughs> intentions and, uh, and inject data where it wasn't supposed to go. Uh, we've probably had talks about that. Um, and so what do you do about that? Well, um, what we do at THG is we program in high-level languages. So most of our code is in Java or JVM uh, languages. And we work in 
Python and things like that. But we're still running on an OS that is written in C and has these same kind of vulnerabilities. It comes with thousands of utilities that have these, these vulnerabilities. And we bind to C library code all the time. So you want to decompress a JPEG, you're in C. If you want to talk open SSL, you're in C. Uh, foreign function interfaces uh, are still in C. Um, and the Java runtime is written in C, or, or big chunks of it are, anyway. Um, and there are other tricks we can do as programmers. So various static and dynamic analysis. Uh, in the operating system space, there have been a number of innovations. Uh, Address-based layout randomization makes it harder to guess pointers. It doesn't make them impossible to guess. It just makes it harder. Um, we can use memory management units to do coarse grain protection of pages. Uh, all of these things are defeatable, is the thing. Um, now, it turns out, that's Kernahan and Ritchie, by the way. They wrote Unix. Uh, the guy in the back wrote the C programming language. That's a PDP-11 which is possibly the root of all evil. Uh, it's actually an extremely elegant machine. It's simple, right? So this architecture is beautiful. And if they had more money, they would have used a fancier machine. We probably wouldn't be in this position right now. But, uh, but they didn't. So they used a simple flat address space machine that you could address plain old memory with plain old integers. And, uh, and they invented a programming language and a, an operating system that became enormously popular. Ran the internet, in fact, still does. Um, and that led to this circular evolution that I think is, is easy to see in technology, which is, does anyone remember the late 80s? It was actually exciting. There were, there were probably a dozen workstation manufacturers jumping over each, each other, trying to innovate in silicon. So we had, I don't know, all kinds of different risk machines. MIPS was out there and Sun, and uh, probably half a dozen microprocessor architectures being evolved in separate directions by companies. Most of them didn't win, but they were all tailored to run Unix fast. Um, and so when presented with something like this, a machine that runs Unix fast, what are you gonna do as a programmer? Well, you're gonna write in the way that the machine wants to be written to, and that's in C. And so we've been in this loop for 34 years, more, 44 years. Um, buffer flow exploits are everywhere. I wrote this slide on Friday afternoon and I got bored of typing these things in. And then over the weekend, I thought, ha, look, there's news. Cisco's announced a bunch of vulnerabilities. So you can, you can do buffer overflows in a handful of Cisco routers now as of last weekend. Um, and I thought that would be good to tell you, maybe I'd squeeze in a new slide, but this morning at 8.30, I was in a stand-up with my boss, the CTO, uh, and he was all worried because there's a new uh, set of vulnerabilities, there are buffer overflow vulnerabilities in APC universal or uninterruptible power supplies. Power supplies, of course, are on the internet, and if you craft carefully a TLS packet and send it to this thing, uh, you can become root on an uninterruptible power supply. What could you do with that? Well, you can make a fire for starters. You change the parameters and run it hot. You can turn off the power. You can use it to jump to other machines that it knows about. It's bad. Uh, and that's, so that was made public yesterday. Uh, this stuff happens all the time. And it's, it's happened in many programs that you work with yourself. I'm quite sure. Uh, there are any number of architectural ways to avoid this, but most of them break C. And if you break C, that's not so good. And it, they don't even just break the C standard. They, they, the C standard's not as bad as, as the way people actually use C. And uh, so, so most of those turn out to be non-starters. You can live in research and do that, and it's interesting. But, uh, but, um, but Robert Watson and various friends at Cambridge uh, have for more than a decade been working on this Cherry project, which probably everyone in this room knows all about. Uh, the idea there, at its most fundamental, is to break the, uh, the conflation of C uh, of, of memory addresses and integers. So a memory address is no longer an integer. However, 
you can compile old C code and it still kind of sort of works most of the time. Almost all the time, in fact, we think. Um, and this lived in research for a long time. Uh, it has been, uh, I guess in about 2014, you probably know the story, um, ARM and Cambridge got together and, and uh, a project was sold to produce a system on a chip that implements Cherry instruction set extensions. Um, now, I'm, I'm led to believe it's hardware. Uh, in theory, some's in the post to us. We, we should have some in the next, uh, sometime soon. Um, which comes to really the crux of all of this. Uh, so what's THG doing about security? Well, mostly it's all the same stuff you're doing, but we, we, did, uh, we did apply for a grant to work on a couple of corners of, uh, of the evolution of the Morello ecosystem. And I wanted to tell you about those briefly. Um, Soteria is, uh, is a project with the University of Manchester and with Oxford. And we're tackling two core areas. One is to get our beloved Java JVM running happily under Morello. So what does that mean? You could probably recompile it and it would work and we wouldn't have any work to do. But it would be really nice if the JVM uh, emitted just-in-time code that used uh, Morello uh, capabilities rather than regular pointers, right? We have to figure out the foreign function interface and how that's going to work. Uh, there's a bunch of interpreter and compiler work uh, getting this thing ported. And, um, and much of that's happening at the University of Manchester. We're doing a little bit of it, but there's a lot of supportive activity being done at THG providing a model e-commerce system that we're going to run in this thing. And we're also doing a bunch of work backporting old JVM vulnerabilities that turn out to be buffer overflows uh, so that we can demonstrate that when we've got this running, uh, it all works. So that's work in progress. I'll be happy to talk to you more about it. Um, there it is. And the second thing we're doing is, is the second tranche of Robert Morris's demonstration. Uh, we would like to be able to detect and mitigate denial of service attacks uh, in real time. And to do that, we are training neural nets to inspect packets um, with the intention to run this code uh, as, a, uh, as a configured FPGA. So an FPGA these days can run as a network interface card as well. And we're trying to offload the processing of, of the actual uh, evaluation of the neural net in real time, evaluating incoming packets to the FPGA. And that leaves us with some interesting FPGA to kernel communications. And we're going to run this on Morello uh, and see what the implications are of that for, uh, for moving between the FPGA, which doesn't have a capability model, and, uh, and Morello, which does. And so those are work in progress, and uh, I'd be happy to talk to any of you about those at lunchtime. And that's me. Thank you, Faith. Well, Ph Philip, that was really good, because over the course of these roadshows, we've heard about the, the flaws in very, various different contexts, and I think you put it well in terms of that programmer's context. So that's well done. Thank you. So next, uh, we're going to have Tim Silversides. Before Tim comes on stage, uh, just quickly introduce him. Um, Tim, is co Tim Silversides is co-founder of Petilia, a Belfast-based software consultancy active in IT infrastructure, healthcare, and fintech domains. He's an experienced technical leader and architect of storage, networking, and compute products for the enterprise, most recently as a distinguished technologist at Hewlett Packard Enterprise. He holds multiple patents in the fields of data storage and distributed systems, and recently secured UKRI funding via his engagement in an earlier DSBD uh, competition to evaluate the DSBD technology. And Tim will take you through his experience as a case study. Tim, over to you. Thank you. So I. I shouldn't keep you too long. Uh, I'm going to take you through the, the title you can see on screen today, Growing Business and Differentiating Through Security by Design. And 
Uh, on that topic, I really want to, uh, to do three things. First of all, to introduce Patilia, uh, which uh, I'm guessing most of you are, are not aware of, give you a, a brief summary of who we are and what we do. Uh, secondly, to talk about our involvement in DSBD so far. And thirdly, to offer a few perspectives on the opportunities and the challenges of the program. Uh, and I would emphasize that, that when we're talking about uh, our perspectives on the program, uh, we're giving an answer to some of the questions uh, that it raises. Uh, we certainly don't claim that's the, the only possible answer. So first of all, on Patilia, uh, what can we say about it? So very briefly, uh, <clears throat> it's, a, uh, as Nathan mentioned, a, a software consultancy. It was founded uh, mid-pandemic, uh, autumn 2020, if I remember correctly, by Angela Montgomery, who's with us today, uh, and myself. We're active, uh, as mentioned, in uh, financial technology, financial services, uh, in healthcare, and, and probably most, most interestingly for today, uh, in the IT infrastructure domain, and we can, can expand a little bit on, on what we mean by that. Uh, our headcount at the moment is somewhere in the 30s, and we, we very recently, just last week, uh, moved into new premises in Belfast. So, so what's special about us? I'm, I'm sure there's a range of, of possible answers there, but I'd like to call out a couple of things that are, uh, are particularly relevant to today's discussion. Uh, the first is, we have a full stack software capability. Who doesn't say that? It's, it's a very cheap and easy claim to make. I think we've slightly more basis than most people uh, to make that claim and that our, our expertise ranges all the way from, uh, from uh, operating system, kernel development, protocol stacks, <clears throat> excuse me, device drivers, all the way up to the UX design and, uh, and mobile app development. Uh, the other thing that's that's interesting for today is is the background of the Patilia core team, uh, and that's very largely in core mission critical IT infrastructure for the enterprise. So so developing those software systems uh, that that keep core operations running for government agencies, for telcos, uh, for uh, financial services companies, for airlines and uh, and other uh, enterprise uh, domains where where those, those building blocks, and we'll give some examples in a moment, where those building blocks are, uh, are, are very key uh, to day-to-day -day operations. Uh, so that's Patilia in a very brief nutshell. Uh, perhaps we can talk for a moment then about our involvement in DSBD, uh, both uh, how we got involved and, and perhaps uh, most interestingly to start with, why did we decide uh, to get involved in the DSBD program? What made it attractive to us? Uh, and I think there, there are probably two things uh, that I'd like to call out here. The first for us uh, that really made it interesting, uh, speaking for ourselves as technologists, is really just the scope, the ambition of the program. Uh, the fact that it, it signaled a move away from uh, a very tactical approach to uh, you know, fixing individual vulnerabilities one by one as they're identified, uh, and, it, and it aims to, to just sweep away uh, a whole category of vulnerabilities, which, uh, as, as Phil has made very clear, are, are very widespread, they're very real, uh, and, and they're occurring uh, on a very regular basis out in the wild. Uh, the other thing that, that made uh, participation interesting for us was, was just uh, the alignment with those, those core features of Patilia, the, the full stack software capability, the background in mission critical uh, enterprise uh, infrastructure, software defined solutions and appliances. Uh, and, and taking those two pieces together, uh, we, we believed that we were ideally placed, uh, first of all, to, to build in uh, DSBD capabilities uh, layer by layer into a software system, which, which is going to be required at some stage. Uh, and secondly, that we could target uh, that functionality uh, at, at at least one of the areas uh, where it's most needed in those, those core building blocks uh, of enterprise IT infrastructure. Uh, so how did we uh, get involved? What form did that take? Uh, so we applied successfully to the Software Ecosystem Project, I think it was called, uh, which was Innovate UK funded and ran for five or six months in the middle of last year. Uh, the specific focus of our uh, project was uh, on packet processing 
Uh, so the incorporation of, uh, of Cherry features into a, a widely used uh, software library for packet processing called DPDK Data Path uh, Development Kit. And I'm, I'm happy to uh, el elaborate in the detail of exactly what we did there uh, and the rationale why, why it made sense to look at that. Uh, I, I don't want to get into the weeds right now, but, but feel free to connect with me offline if that's interesting for you. Uh, so how do we get on? Uh, I guess there were a few few good outcomes for us. Uh, just step through them one by one. I guess the first is that in terms of the project itself, uh, we we actually uh, did what we set out to do. We proved that yes, uh, Cherry can be incorporated into this packet processing library. Yes, it does provide protection against buffer overflows, accessing uh, the wrong data from uh, network flows that shouldn't be accessing uh, and, uh, and a few other details. Uh, but I'd like to call out that, that although the specific project we were involved in was very narrowly focused on, on packet processing and on the networking world, we believe its findings are much more broadly applicable to a range of IT infrastructure components. So things like uh, storage controllers, uh, routers that were, that were mentioned a moment ago, uh, switches, um, hypervisors and, uh, and probably a few others uh, that, that don't immediately come to mind. Uh, we got some, some very encouraging uh, feedback from Innovate UK. Thanks, John, for, uh, for your very positive comments there. Much appreciated. Uh, and we're able to establish a very successful and collaborate, collaborative relationship with the CSIP team at, at Queen's University here in Belfast. Uh, Circling back then, I guess, and, and really just to wrap up uh, to the, the two aspects uh, of, our, of our title, growing business and, and differentiating. Uh, first of all, it's great that Innovate UK recognised the challenge uh, involved in, in delivering a project of this uh, scope and the fact that there is that, that tight coupling between, uh, between hardware that, that introduces new functionality and software that, that takes advantage of that hardware and uh, that, that they're encouraging uh, development of, of both of those streams in parallel. Uh, and I think it, it is widely recognized that, that for that ecosystem to flourish, it, we, we need a lot of pieces to, to fall into place. And, and that includes uh, you know, things like development tools, language runtimes, documentation, and a, and a whole host of other things that, that I could mention. Uh, but one other thing that, that we think uh, is important and will become more important uh, as we as we move along uh, the path to commercialization it is the presence of trusted technical advisors uh, who can collaborate with with companies with product developers who are considering uh, the adoption of, of DSB DSBD technologies into their products and that's where we believe uh, Patelia can fit in for us it would be a very big leap to go from from the relatively uh, narrowly focused uh, proof of concept that, that we did last year to uh, a, a full product in the IT infrastructure space. There's, there's a very high cost of entry, uh, both on the R&D side uh, and on the business side. Uh, but we believe we can, in the DSBD world, do what we already do elsewhere, which is to act as uh, high value technical consultants, trusted advisors, uh, participating in, in niche R&D and, and de-risking the adoption of DSBD uh, by product developers. Uh, so that's, that's what we've said on, on growing, growing business. What about differentiating? Uh, really, this ties in with, with what I just said. There's, uh, there's a longer term differentiation for, where we uh, are interested in seeing if we can position ourselves as those trusted advisors. Short term, there, there are a number of small wins, and, and we've listed a few of them here. We, we get the opportunity to, to build credibility in cybersecurity. We have a talking point about uh, some of the, the work we've been engaged in. We can showcase our involvement in cutting edge research. We have referenceability uh, for, for a piece of work that, that we've been involved in, uh, the ability to, to quote it publicly, which, which is a challenge uh, at times for, for some of the other projects we're involved in. We get to raise our uh, awareness of our brand in the market uh, which is valuable not only for bringing in new business, but also for attracting talent uh, to show that we're, we're, we're serious about uh, advancing our skills and, and being involved in, uh, in uh, dramatic uh, technological advances uh, as promised by, by DSBD. 
Uh, and alongside that, we uh, have had the opportunity to, to develop partnerships with ESIT, uh, with UKRI, uh, which we hope will, will have benefits for the future. Each of those valuable in their own right, but, but the more interesting thing for us is that they feed in to our longer term uh, goal and, uh, and we hope our longer term point of differentiation, uh, which is that we can act as uh, that trusted advisor for adoption of DSBD technologies. That's really uh, all I have to say. I just want to uh, say it's been a privilege to, to be involved in this program so far. Look forward to seeing it develop and a special thanks to, to all those who have been with us on the journey and encourage us so far. Thanks for your time. Thank you, Thank you Tim. That was a, a very useful sort of um, input in terms of uh, uh, what uh, we we're doing here. Um, throughout this roadshow, I've been very impressed with the speakers we've had. I mean, we started with Alan Turing's nephew, Dermot Turing, and uh, we're going to end with somebody uh, who I, I think I'm excited to hear from. Um, Having invented a high-speed silicon security chip that is used in more than 100 million TV set-top boxes, Professor Maya O'Neill is one of Europe's leading experts on digital security and is currently Professor of Information Security at Queen's Centre for Information Technologies, which I drove past last night, CSIP. Uh, she is widely regarded as one of Europe's leading crypto cryptography experts, helping enhance global data security her research involves designing security solutions for communications applications, including email, cloud, and mobile technologies. She was invited by the European Commission to become a member of the Young Advisors Group, which is shaping the future by lending expertise on how to achieve Europe's digital agenda. If, if, say a bit more about you, Maya. Um, professor O'Neill was the youngest ever professor to be appointed at uh, Queen's at the age of 32 and was also the university's first female professor in electrical and electronic engineering. She was also instrumental in the creation of CSIT at Queen's, which has established strong links with global security organizations. Mark, can I welcome you to the stage? Thank you for that truly embarrassing introduction. Much appreciated. <laughs> Um, so today I won't be talking about any of those things. I guess I'm asked, I've been asked to sort of predict the future um, and what the future would look like if we have trusted uh, computing. So first of all, I'm, I'm, uh, just to say I'm delighted that CSIT have had the opportunity to co-host uh, this Digital Security by Design Roadshow event with UKRI here in Belfast. So delighted that you're all able to join us here in person and indeed online. So first of all, for those who may be not so familiar with CSIT, um, the CSIT is the Center for Secure Information Technologies, and it uh, sits within our Institute of Electronics, Communications and IT, or ESIT, at Queen's University, Belfast. And we're a national innovation and knowledge center in cybersecurity, and we were established back in 2009. So uh, over the years, we've received recognition and numerous awards for the work that we do, both on the research and innovation of our activities in cybersecurity and strengthening uh, global cybersecurity. And we've also been recognised for the work that we do in promoting the local, um, very now very strong uh, cybersecurity ecosystem that we have here in the region. We're also an academic uh, centre of excellence in cybersecurity research and cybersecurity education as recognised by our National Cybersecurity Centre. So just to say a little bit about our under, uh, underpinning sort of research strengths, um, in terms of our research activities, we focus on the underpinning technologies uh, that can be used to secure complex systems. So we look at, the, you know, really the full remit of looking at secure devices, looking at the securing the communication between devices, and then looking at securing the information that can be gathered from devices and stored on the cloud. So we have divided our activity into sort of four main areas, looking at sort of things like trusted hardware, advanced crypto, looking at cyber resilience and network security, and industrial control system security, and then security intelligence, so AI for cyber and, and cyber security for AI. So in terms of uh, the this Digital Security by Design Roadshow, we kicked, uh, it was kicked off back on the 21st of February, uh, where we heard about the history of computing from, uh, as was just mentioned, from Sir Dermot Turing and also from Dr. Andrew Herbert, who was uh, 
who's from the National uh, Museum of Computing at Bletchley. And we also heard, um, as I think Professor um, Tomlinson this morning spoke about, uh, Professor Genevieve Lively, um, who talked about how we should look back to move forward in computing. And she quoted uh, Thomas Watson and his prediction back in 1943 about where, where we would be uh, in terms of the world of computing. And, and perhaps he got it a little bit wrong. So I guess if we look at where we are today, you know, there are billions of computers in the world and indeed billions of connected computing devices. So however, this alarming increase in the adoption of this computing technology and these devices has obviously led us to where we are with the significant threat of cybersecurity and indeed uh, a, a threat that's quite very challenging as we've heard today already, very challenging to address. So we are seeing uh, increasing attacks against IoT devices. And indeed, many of these attacks are down to very simple issues like devices not using uh, or, or being sort of shipped with default passwords. But those sort of vulnerabilities can be mitigated against through regulation and indeed are uh, in recent years. But we are also seeing examples of very significant and major cyber attacks. And you heard about a number of these, even uh, from our last speakers um, and earlier in the roadshow from other speakers, things like Heartbleed and, and these other major attacks. And we're also seeing attacks, though, targeting the very foundation of many of these devices. So the underpinning microprocessor architectures. And micro, these microarchitect tool attacks like uh, Meltdown and Spectre, and I'm sure many of the room have heard of these, have targeted uh, microprocessors, including Intel, AMD, and ARM microprocessors. And for all of these types of attacks, we've seen patches and workarounds, and we've heard from the other speakers already today about how costly this process is of patching and, and mitigating, trying to mitigate against these vulnerabilities. And really, it doesn't provide a, a true defense against the, the kind of underlying flaws and the, the exploits continue. So what this digital security by design program really is about is looking at a major shift away from this cycle of patching and vulnerability mitigations to sort of a new platform where security against these software vulnerabilities is built in. So at the last two events uh, in Newport and in Glasgow, we heard about the new technologies um, and about how this whole program is seeking to, uh, to really look at strengthening cybersecurity foundations. So we heard about, uh, first of all, from Professor Simon Moore, and hopefully you'll be able to, uh, if you are interested in finding out more details, you'll be able to check um, out the, the videos from the previous events. But um, as was summarized earlier, um, in terms of, of some of the underpinning work in this area and the technologies, we heard from Professor Simon Moore in Glasgow about Cherry. So this is the Capability Hardware Enhanced Risk Infrastructure, and or instruction, sorry. And really what these are trying to do, it's, it's a new hardware technology that mitigates uh, software security vulnerabilities. And it looks at extending the conventional hardware instruction set architectures with new features to enable fine-grained memory protection and highly scalable software compartmentalization. So in terms of then uh, the, you know, how, how this fits in, well, this digital security by design program looks at trying to create a more secure digital infrastructure based on, uh, on Cherry on this principles and looks at implementing an updated hardware architecture, developing the software and the, the system development tools around that, and then looking at demonstrating the application and the benefits uh, to, to industry sectors. And we've heard for the previous two speakers have outlined some of the, the funded projects under DSBD showing the advantages uh, of this uh, within these sectors. So if we look, think about 70% of uh, operating system vulnerabilities are due to memory safety issues. And really this DSBD program is really at the heart of trying to address this major, major issue. So there finally, uh, we've the, the Morello boards, um, and uh, again at, at, on Tuesday in Newport, and um, we heard more detail on, on this activity um, from Richard Griswith, the uh, Chief Security Architect at ARM, about these boards. So these are the prototype SOC development boards of this new DSBD technology, um, developed by ARM, but free to use by all, um, and based on this cherry, cherry uh, protection model. So ultimately, really what we're seeing with this, with the overall program, it's going to lead to more trustworthy uh, computing systems. 
And what does that mean for the future of computing? So what in the future if we could truly uh, trust computers? So this is where I've been asked to kind of predict what, what the future will look like. So I guess we could envision a future where computing technology is truly interweaved into every aspect of our lives. So where privacy and security are no longer of concern. So that's probably not great for all the people in this room because we'd be all out of job, right? <laughs> However, what a great future that would be. So I guess we would imagine AI, AI would be everywhere. Uh, smart cities could, would be a reality. And rather than thinking about an internet of things, we'd have the AI of things. We could also um, have uh, and envision a world with autonomous cars, um, airborne autonomous vehicles. Um, and we'd also have computing technology uh, really integrated into all our healthcare services. So helping with things in terms of remote healthcare, with medical diagnostics. Apologies, you're skipping on ahead. Um, and we could probably envision uh, computing technology that uses brain computing interfaces. So I don't know if, if anyone's watching the, the latest series uh, on, I think it's Amazon Prime Upload, which talks about all of these sort of great technologies. So we probably could imagine a world where some of those uh, are indeed a reality. And indeed we have uh, autonomous robots and humanoids, digital currency will be used uh, universally, and our working environments will be enhanced by virtual reality. And meetings, conferences, uh, events like today, social gatherings via metaverses, uh, 3D virtual worlds will be commonplace. So you may think that all of these technologies will be a reality anyway, but we won't get there unless we can truly trust the hardware they're running on. So if we think about the, the consequences of autonomous cars running on untrustworthy hardware, or if we have untrustworthy, untrustworthy devices within our healthcare system, or indeed how we could truly trust somebody you're meeting in a virtual world. So this DSBD program is a really key first step to making these potential, uh, making these uh, potential sort of future uh, a reality. So the pyramid of uh, Khufu at Giza was built in the 26th century BC on a solid limestone rock plateau. And because it was built uh, on a strong foundation, it has stood the test of time. So as I mentioned, uh, this program seeks to strengthen cybersecurity foundations. So there are many other levels of security, so it will still keep us in a job, uh, that also need to be addressed. Uh, supply chain security, software security, secure software development, system security, application security, and so on. However, with a, a strong, secure foundation and this digital security by design approach, uh, the proposed DSBD technologies, like the pyramids, should stand the test of time and, and help us to achieve a truly trusted uh, computing system in the future. So how can, how can folk engage with, with the, the program and, and the technologies? Well, we, we did hear at the last talk a detailed uh, analysis of this and how we can participate. But just to summarize, uh, the DSBD program is currently running this technology access uh, program, which was developed to build a pipeline um, and community of developers and technology companies to try and experiment with these new technologies. So participants have access to the Morello boards, technical guides, and funding to experiment uh, with these technologies. So there are four open calls uh, over the course of the year uh, for participants to engage. Uh, and the first call will close at the end of this month on the 31st of March, 2022. So if you are interested, please, uh, for further details, visit the, the website at dsbd.tech and it will tell you more about the program, the activities, and indeed how to participate in the technology access program. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you, Maya, and uh, thank you to all our speakers today and all across all four roadshows. Um, just uh, wanted to say um, it's been a pleasure working with um, the DSBD group. Um, I got involved after a conversation with John Godeka probably about a year or two ago. Um, he approached me and uh, because I was writing a lot about uh, security and um, chip security, etc. So we ended up having a conversation and then when they asked me to do partner with this, I was really happy. So I think 
it'd be really worth uh, all the events that I've uh, been involved with here. They're all uh, recorded and online. And I would say, you know, if there's any aspect that you want to recover, you know, please do go to the recorded events online. Uh, it's been, as I said, it's been a pleasure. Um, and this brings us to a close of the uh, roadshow. And um, all, all that's left for people in the room is to go and network and talk to speakers and have lunch. And uh, to participants online, thank you very much for attending. And I hope you've all enjoyed it. Thank you. <laughs>